Okay. And I'll spotlight you. Very good. Okay, so so let's get this underway. And um, I am going to do something today where I'm going to try to continue to focus on the invasion of the Ukraine and, and in particular view it from a, a different perspective than we've been viewing it from in the last couple of weeks, which is, is to try to understand a little bit more what's going on with Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, and with the Russian people as well. So, so to understand uh, your adversary, I think is an essential principle. Uh, and uh, in particular, as we begin to try to figure out how to create that fine line between what we need to do to deter and punish Russia's aggression and what we dare not risk in terms of provoking a nuclear superpower with hypersonic weapons that we cannot protect ourselves from being as clear as possible about what Putin's calculus is, what his standing is within his own society, and how much latitude that gives us to, to try to figure out how we do not acquiesce, how we punish him, how we make him pay a price for aggression so that he does not repeat. And at the same time, how we avoid the tripwires that could be globally catastrophic, right? And, and, and so in order to do that, I, I don't have clear cut answers to this, should the Polish give MiGs, old Soviet jets to the Ukrainians. I'm, I'm inclined to think that that's probably not that productive, in part because eventually the Soviet, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk more about the Soviet Union today, the Russian military is going to be uh, successful at destroying the airports and runways of the Ukraine. And so those, those fighters are gonna be a, a very limited uh, utility for the Ukrainians. But, but having said that, some understanding of what's going on with Putin and Russia is essential uh, to our ongoing calculations about how to support the Ukraine, how to punish Putin, his regime, the oligarchs that surround him and have enriched themselves through this regime and the broader Russian people. The other thing I want to do today is to connect what I want to introduce in terms of the broader context of thinking about Russia with themes we were talking about a few weeks ago before the lecture series we were in the middle of got interrupted. And, and, and so uh, can we understand Putin and Russia's thinking is, 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 is one aspect of this. But the other aspect of this, if you remember that lecture series was titled Deranged Democracy. And I wanna focus on deranged autocracy today and, and, and why it is that decision-making and public opinion to the extent that it exists at all is um, typically both very manipulated and extremely unstable and unreliable in a regime that does its best to counter uh, information with disinformation, to manipulate information and opinion formation, uh, to remove the institutions that allow for a functioning public sphere. And, and those aren't just the free press, it's, it, it, it's freedom of academic inquiry, it's freedom of assembly, it's the general uh, presumption that when you communicate, you're not being surveilled, right? And, and, and with the absence of all of that and, and new technology to make all of that more efficient in 21st century Russia, then, then understanding how autocracy is deeply deranged 
by connecting it back to some of the themes we had begun to discuss and, and to, to then point out that as, as much as contemporary democracy might from the inside appear to be deranged, our politics might appear to be crazy, some of the people we vote for and some of the things they say uh, often appear to be somewhat unhinged, it's nothing in comparison to autocracy. And, and so in comparison to democracy, I'm sorry, autocracy, I think democracy looks at, at worse deluded as opposed to deranged. And, and so I wanna develop that contrast with you a little bit as well today. In order to be able to do this, I'm going to bypass for now a discussion of what's going on on the ground in the Ukraine or mainly what's going on uh, day by day in Russia since February 24th, that, that we will maybe come to some of those themes in the course of our discussion. But uh, if I were to spend time on that, I fear there wouldn't be enough time to really cover the material I want to cover with you in, in detail, that I think maybe provides some deeper context and, and some ways of uh, illuminating uh, the, the background to this catastrophic and incredible incredibly risky war that is unfolding in the Ukraine right now. And, and so uh, I've got on, on the board here uh, Vladimir Putin, whose dark mind I'm going to try to get into a, a, a little bit today in order to understand his calculus and his reasoning. And to be clear, uh, I'm using the term deranged to, to describe the regime that he is at the top of. And I think the decision to invade the Ukraine was in many respects very poorly informed. It was a miscalculation. And it's a miscalculation that has now backed not only Vladimir Putin, but in a sense, the whole world with him into a very dangerous corner where he really cannot win this war, right? I mean, he, he may succeed in raising to the ground the cities of the Ukraine. He may succeed in executing Vladimir Zelensky, the president and the heroic leader of the Ukraine. He may succeed in installing a puppet regime to rule the Ukraine, but he will encounter perpetual resistance to his rule, resistance that his invasion has catalyzed. And so he deeply misunderstood what he was doing and what its results would likely be. The intelligence now suggests that the Russian military had suggested to Vladimir Putin that this war would be over in maybe 24 hours. That explains a fair bit of the uh, terrible strategic decisions that the Russian military made. They thought they could get paratroopers into Kiev. They thought they could um, decapitate the regime. They thought the Ukrainian people would not care very much that they were being subject to a hostile regime change so long as it happened quickly and bloodlessly and there was some pretext for doing it that the Russian military could propagandize using the tools of social media, right? Absolute, total delusion about how this was going to unfold militarily. But having said all of that, I do think that there is a, a coherence, a logic, um, a structure to Putin's thinking. And in a sense, understanding the world, the assumptions, the values, the time frame that he is thinking in terms of help us to understand why he did this and also what it is that is prudent, savvy for us to do in, in response to it. And I've, I've put an, a, another uh, image on the board. If you haven't been to Moscow in the last six years, you probably don't recognize the Ivan the Terrible Monument, which uh, Putin had constructed, right? First monument in Moscow to Ivan the Terrible, the, the, the czar whose name in a sense says uh, a, a great deal about the way in which he ruled. And I, I just wanna be as clear as possible, Putin 
is, is, is trying to rehabilitate Ivan the Terrible. And it fits his view of Russian history that Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Joseph Stalin are a series of heroic nationalist leaders who had the combination of brutality, expansionistic ambition, and Russian cultural value required to uh, make Russia the world power that it was or is under their regimes. And, and so that's beginning to think about, if you will, the, the, the genealogy that Putin has constructed for himself in Russian political history. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about Putin's biography, but I, I, I do wanna focus on uh, a chilling episode from early in his career when he was, I believe, the KGB station chief in East Berlin in the late 1980s, 1989 to be precise, when uh, the people of East Berlin began mass protests against the Berlin Wall, the isolation of East Berlin from West Germany. Uh, and um, this is in the period of, of, of Glasgow's under Michel Gorbachev, the Soviet Union is opening up and the East Germans see this as an opportunity uh, to begin to tear down the artificial barriers that separate them from the much more wealthy, much more uh, free uh, and uh, democratic people of the West. And Vladimir Putin asks the person who's above him in the command chain for permission to use lethal force to gun down the protesters. Remember, this is a, uh, a Russian in East Germany. The East German state, which has a, you know, its own very powerful apparatus of repression, the Stasi among it, uh, is not using force against its own people. So Putin wants the Russians to, to, to gun down the Germans in order to prevent them from uh, protesting against communist rule. And uh, Putin does not get permission. He asks again and again. Eventually, he's, he's told, you cannot do this without Moscow permission. He says, what does Moscow say? And he's told, Moscow is silent. And, and, and in a sense, from what Putin says, his own writings, the people who write about him, this is a formative experience for him in, in, in the sense that he thinks his instinct to use brutal force to maintain Russian dominance over a province was the right decision. And the failure of will re represented in Moscow's unwillingness to authorize mowing down the East German protesters is the beginning of the collapse of the Russian empire. He sees it that way. I think we would say the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it is the beginning of a series of events that by the time you get to the mid to the late 1990s has reduced Russia to a basket case economy, uh, powerless in world politics, unable to feed its own people. And so that I think is one critical event to, to, to recognize. And, and then the next thing to, to be thinking about in terms of Putin's biography here is that after he is uh, chosen by Boris Yeltsin to be his successor after he becomes the leader of a humbled and struggling Russia in the late 1990s, he undertakes a campaign of rebuilding the Russian state and reasserting state control over the Russian economy and then using the Russian control of the economy to create foreign currency reserves. We talked about this last week uh, that, that uh, allow him to insulate 
Russia initially against the vicissitudes of the global economy. Never again will the ruble be so devalued that it uh, prevents Russia from getting the goods that it needs or that it subjects the people of Russia to hyperinflation. And I think, again, it's worthwhile remembering that this is a tremendous success. And so that Putin, by the time we get to the end of the first decade of the 21st century, 10 years ago or so, is seen as a, a remarkable statesman within Russia, somebody who has rebuilt the Russian economy, the, the Russian state, and in so doing has used a great deal of force. What is, I think, less commonly uh, paid attention to is at the same time that Putin is rebuilding the Russian state and the Russian economy, accumulating foreign reserves, increasing the standard of living, insulating the Russian economy from the vulnerabilities that interdependence might create. Uh, he is also beginning to, to really be a political entrepreneur in what we now call competitive authoritarianism. And um, I'm, I'm going to speak later in more detail about the idea of competitive authoritarianism. But the idea here is that in the 21st century, you can stabilize autocratic, tyrannical rule, the rule of, a, of essentially a single individual or a small cadre of people by, on the one hand, um, monopolizing the tools of power and using them to repress your genuine opponents, but on the other hand, creating the appearance of a somewhat open society. And, and part of the way you do that is by cultivating the opposition that you know can't actually threaten you. And that uh, Putin and the people around him did this very um, fastidiously. They, they, they were uh, deeply involved in uh, selecting, financing, and supporting the opposition that Putin knew he would ultimately defeat, and did so in order to create the appearance, on the one hand, that there was something like democracy competition, that's that's the competition in, in competitive authoritarianism. And on the other hand, in the occasional performance of elections generating legitimacy, right? And 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 so one of the things uh, I'm drawing a fair bit today on, on Masha Gessen's work as well as Hannah Arendt's earlier work on on earlier regimes like this, these kinds of regimes uh, have plebiscitories, right? E elections where you vote up and down on the leader. And in the 21st century, they have elections, right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, elections with a, uh, a Potemkin opposition. And the reason you continue to go through these motions is because in mobilizing the population to come out to vote and vote for Putin, they end up um, consolidating Putin's control over the very apparatus that he uses to mobilize people to vote, the apparatus of the state, of the military. And so if he is perceived to be the clear favorite of the people, the legitimate leader of Russia, the savior of Russia, then that consolidates his control over power and the state. And he learned that lesson in the early 2000s, started putting it in place. And we'll get more into this, but, but as the, the decades progressed, he also, and the people around him, increasingly recognized the power of a digital communication system that increasingly captures the attention of the populace and the way in which it could be used to, in a sense, camouflage the way in which the state is manipulating the public sphere or the people's perception of reality, the information that they have access to. There's an old Soviet joke um, 
and and I'll see if I can do it. Ni pravda is vestia ni vestia pravda. And if if you remember your Soviet history, the two major newspapers of the Soviet Union were Pravda, the, the party newspaper, and Izvestia, the state newspaper. Pravda, truth, Izvestia, news. The saying is there's no news in the truth, there's no truth in the news. And it was in part a joke about the rivalry between the two papers and the state and the party, but it was also, I think, a way of acknowledging in a joke the deeper reality that you shouldn't rely on either of those sources because the truth and the news are not present in either of those papers. And what I think is, is remarkable about the 21st century version of tyrannical autocracy, competitive authoritarianism as we like to call it, is that the use of social media gives a much more decentered, less state-centered appearance to the manufacturing of disinformation and propaganda. If it appears to be coming not from the state or the party, but just from somebody posting online, never mind that they're paid by the state, that they have all these followers because the state has created bots to follow them, it appears in a sense that it's not the state, but the, it's ordinary people manufacturing the disinformation, it appears then less as disinformation and less manufactured. And, and so Putin uh, perfects this new system for maintaining autocratic control. And around a decade ago appears also to pivot in terms of his statescraft and, and begins to, um, focus less on protecting the Russian domestic economy from the interdependence that a global economy generates and more on expanding Russia. And now he's focused on his role in this small pantheon of great Russian leaders who appeal to the idea of a greater Russia, of Mother Russia. And of course, in 2008, this starts with the invasion of Georgia. In 2014, it continues with the annexation of the Crimea. In 2015, 16, right, the increasing involvement of Russia in Syria. Uh, and now we're up to 2022 with the invasion of the Ukraine. And, and so the idea that in a sense, the same tools that Putin cultivated to protect his economy from global interference can now be used to promote an expansionistic militaristic foreign policy. That at least helps us to understand a little bit about how we get from 1989, Putin wanting to train the guns on the East Germans to 2022, Putin sending hundreds of thousands of conscripted Russian soldiers into the Ukraine to level and raise its cities rather than engaging in urban warfare in order to uh, reclaim the Ukraine for greater Russia. Now, let me uh, start being a little bit more philosophical, theoretical, trying to situate um, Putin's style of thought in some other traditions. And I'm going to suggest that Putin is an anti-modern and anti-political leader. And, and I'll try to explain those two terms to you in just a moment. I, I want to start with the fact that Putin completely rejects the post-Cold War international order, which has been a, an order rooted in norms and rules of international law. I, I don't want to suggest that that order has been uniformly obeyed, far from it. But nevertheless, there has been an effort to try to articulate uh, principles and laws that govern nations among them, the idea that wars of aggression are never justified, that targeting of civilians is a war crime, and that war too will be governed by 
law, including putting the people who violate the rules and laws of norms uh, and norms of, of international law will be prosecuted by tribunals or international courts. And, and, and that, that Putin views all of this as not only hypocritical, this, this is the West's effort to restrain the rest of the world in resisting its economic might and power, but it is also just nonsensical, right? That, that, that what the West is doing is imposing this charade on the rest of the world because it is the most powerful or the most powerful group of countries, right? The United States, NATO, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which Putin thinks maybe he could have prevented, uh, were unrivaled, hegemonic. It's a unipolar world with only one superpower and the superpower gets to pretend what it's doing is creating international order when in fact, all it's doing is imposing its will and power on the rest of the world. And um, let me just show you a, a little bit of, of data that, that suggests some of the reasonableness perhaps of, of this worldview. I don't wanna suggest that it is actually accurate. I, I, I certainly reject it, but I do think there's enough evidence to support it that it doesn't look completely mad. And, and, and so I think I might've shown you this <laughs> last week. This is the vote at the United Nations for, against and abstaining the uh, condemning of Russian aggression. And it's listed not by countries, the, the, the number of countries that supported the resolution condemning Russia was 144. Those abstaining, I believe was 34, against was four or five. So the motion carried with uh, you know, overwhelming support if we're looking one country, one vote. But if we look at the population of the countries that either abstained or voted against, it's a clear majority of the world's population. And some of that has to do just with Russia's influence over China and India, or China's desire to support Russia for various reasons I may have time to get into uh, at, at some point. But I think part of it also has to do with, with beginning to look at, at things like this, right? This is the global distribution of wealth, right? And, and, and if you look at this, right, the United States, which has about 4% of the world's population, has 30% of the world's wealth, right? China, which has somewhere approaching uh, a sixth or a seventh of the world's population, has um, less than 20% of the world's wealth. India, which is very similar in population, has less than 4% of the world's wealth. And, and uh, as you can see, um, Africa, the, the share of wealth is so small, it barely shows up. Something similar is true for Latin America. So, so basically North America, Asia and Europe dominate the world's wealth. And that in part is due to the system of international norms, rules, laws that were set up in the aftermath of the Cold War. It's also obviously something to do with the European system of imperialism that took resources from the rest of the world and brought them to Europe and increasingly the United States uh, over the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. And, and uh, I'll be very brief with this, but um, these diagrams basically show the, the way in which um, international uh, foreign direct investment uh, in the decade immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union rep resulted in a huge transfer of wealth out of Africa, out of Latin America, out of Eastern Europe as well, out of parts of Asia to, to the United States to Western Europe. And in particular, the way in which the international debt crisis of the, the mid 1980s, now we're getting to an earlier period, also destroyed a lot of the wealth of 
uh, other parts of the world, especially Latin America at that point, but also Africa. And, and so the idea that the, the West, which, which became the sole dominant power in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, used its dominance to create an international order that allowed it to continue, in a sense, the political economy of colonialism in a post-colonial world is, I think, one of the things that Putin looks at when he sees the principles of, of the United Nations or the Geneva Con Convention or the international criminal courts and tribunals and says, this is just a show, right? This doesn't matter. It doesn't work. An another aspect of this would be global climate change. Uh, again, the, the West and especially the United States and Europe contributing the vast majority of the carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere and now essentially trying to impose the costs of resisting catastrophe uh, unfairly on the rest of the world. So with all of that in mind, right, Putin is rejecting the, this international order, views it as hypocritical and nonsensical. And Russia is just not going to respect it. And that's not only evident in the fact that he has invaded the Ukraine, but it's evident in the way in which he is conducting the war in the Ukraine. The Russians don't probably have the capacity to conduct sustained urban warfare to capture the major cities of the Ukraine. So rather than fighting block by block, house by house, which is some of the most difficult kind of warfare in the modern world, they will simply train artillery on the cities, turn the electricity and the gas off, prevent food from getting in and pummel and starve and freeze the population of the Ukraine. And if you don't believe that there's such a thing as a war crime, why wouldn't you do this if you have the power to do it? Now, I also want to refer to Putin as anti-modern. And, and, and to be as clear as possible about this, there's a reason that he reaches back to Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great as his predecessors, as, as the line of Russian leaders that he wants to put himself in. These were not Western facing thinkers. And, and, and some of you may know that Putin has been, uh, among other things, a hero to some of the far and alt-right in Western Europe. And some of that is about the way in which he has revived the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodoxy, and, and imposed it on society, the way in which, uh, for instance, homosexuality is not only illegal, but strongly persecuted in Putin's Russia. And, and there's a sense in which I think Putin believes that it's not just the post-Cold War global order that is a mistake. It is the entire transition to a integrated and more cosmopolitan and democratic Europe that is a mistake. And, and, and so, uh, to be as clear as possible, I think Putin thinks in terms of the great power game still, but I think you will have a hard time finding in Germany or Britain or France, France is probably the closest to this, uh, a substantial portion of the population that still believes in ethno-nationalist expansionary politics, believes that uh, what France needs to do is to uh, create colonies. And if Britain or Spain or Germany is going to resist it because France needs to get the resources from the rest of the world, then we will go to war with those countries, perhaps in the areas in Africa or uh, Latin America 
where we are trying to expand perhaps on the European continent itself, right? And, and, and so this idea that the, the country needs to only take into account its own geopolitical interests and act on the basis of the power that it can accumulate to pursue those interests is obviously characteristic of European statecraft and international relations from at least the 18th century to the middle of the 20th century. But in the aftermath of World War II, and then with the construction and the deepening integration of the European Union with the uh, stabilization of democracy and public spheres in European countries, I think Europe has moved away from this view of international relations and of statecraft. It has become less nationalistic, less eth ethnically focused on the way in which it conceives of the nation. That, that's still work in progress, but I do think there has been real progress in that regard. And most importantly, um, much more integrated economically and therefore much less competitive in terms of statescraft. And, and, and if all of that is one face of modernity, I think another face of modernity is post-traditionalism. The idea that although it may be the case that France is a traditionally Catholic country and Britain is a traditionally Protestant country and that there is a literature and a culture and a way of life associated with a long project of nation construction in both of those countries, it is no longer automatically normative for the people. They don't automatically assume the worldview that is the tradition of their society. As opposed to that, they are postmodern, skeptical, post-traditional, not as deeply committed to those worldviews, thinking for themselves, constructing for themselves their own values, their own life plans, their own worldviews, and that results in greater diversity and heterogeneity, a lot of atheism, a lot of agnosticism, a lot of openness to things like homosexuality, uh, interracial marriage, international marriage. Remember, essentially, the European Union does not have internal borders. And so you have lots of French people marrying Germans and Poles, etc. Right. And, and, and so all of that to say, um, this is a different world that has been constructed, a different kind of culture, a different kind of, you might call it the life world of European societies in the aftermath of World War II and then the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. And I know we've, we've looked at this diagram together before. I just wanna try to indicate its relevance in, in these circumstances. And um, this diagram uh, is drawing on Emile Durkheim's work and, and it suggests that I don't want to belabor what I've already covered with you before, that every society performs certain tasks of integration and regulation over its members, where social integration is giving people stable roles that allow them to understand what it is for them to contribute to society in the way in which they are expected to, and yet also allow sufficient latitude for initiative and individuality such that the role is not oppressive or stultifying. And similarly, that societies provide norms of moral regulation that tell people clearly what is and isn't permitted, and that only when we occupy a stable normative world with sufficient regulation is it clear where and how we are able to pursue our interests and what isn't allowed, and, and that we need these kinds of roles and this kind of guidance from our society in order to feel like we occupy uh, 
an ordered, stable, integrative social world. And, and that one of the things I think we, we've got to remember about Russia and, and Russian history is that they moved very quickly from communism into what I've referred to before as, as, as the shock therapy of rapid marketization that resulted in near economic collapse and then very quickly back into more authoritarian state managed capitalism. And I think Vladimir Putin tells himself a story. And I think the story has a certain amount of plausibility for the Russian people as a whole, that what Russia was doing was going down the Western European path. And down that path lies anarchy, egoism, and anomie, right? That, that, that this is not just economic vulnerability, it is social disintegration, it is nihilism, it's a world in which everything is permitted and the Russian people don't want that world and Vladimir Putin has protected them against that world. And so I've, I've, I've tried to, again, in, in the context of American politics, indicate the relevance of, of a diagram I've constructed on the basis of Karen Stenner's work on the authoritarian dynamic. We're used to thinking of a left-right political spectra spectrum. Do you favor an activist state with lots of regulation, taxation, and redistribution, or a minimalist state where essentially what happens in the market determines how people are going to do in your society. If that's a very simplified version of a left-right competition, one of the things that has happened in many Western societies' politics is an alternative kind of competition seems to be breaking out between people who say, um, let's embrace diversity, let's embrace cultural change, let's embrace immigration and try to repair the injustices of the past. Let's recognize that if you give people freedom, they will use that freedom to become post-traditional, to openly express their homosexuality, to uh, basically reject the hold of religion and traditional worldviews. And as opposed to that, you have leaders who say, no, we're, we're not gonna allow that to happen. That's happening too fast. It's too disorienting. It is terrible for our children. It results in a world in which we are at sea lacking the kind of integration that we need. And that Putin is very much in this authoritarian leadership style, which is also popular in the West. And he looks at the West and he says, look at what they have. That's not what we want. And I will construct the alternative institutions that keep the forces of nihilistic modernity at bay, right? And, and, and so, a second important element of Putin's politics is his anti-modernism. And again, I think this is plainly on display in what's happening in Russia right now with the complete elimination of all of the institutions of political and civil society, the institutions that allow for free and open transmission of ideas and information. David? Yes, go ahead. Wilma, can I break in for a minute? Please, I always welcome that. Uh, go ahead, Wilma. Okay. What happens in a democratic society when the democracy is on the cusp of committing suicide? When you have, when you, your choice of an election and the likely winner of an election is an authoritarian. So, um, I, I, I think I've used this category in, in talking with you before, and it's the focus of some of my scholarship right now. The category is democratic self-repair, that in a democracy, there's no alternative, but for the democracy to figure out why it is that authoritarian leaders are gaining increasing popular appeal and winning 
elections and doing things that undermine democracy. And I, I want to be as clear as possible. I'm, I'm not going to be able to give this lecture today, but I, I, I'm teaching a course this summer. Maybe I'll do it with, with you guys as well on courts and constitutions and democracy and the idea that increasingly the Supreme Court is an impediment to democratic self-repair. Uh, and, and, and so how do we do it? We've got to do it through elections, right? You've got to get the people who support democracy to win elections and then pass legislation that addresses not just the symptoms, that's the rise of the you know conservative authoritarian uh, anti-democrats within a democracy, but also the underlying social and cultural conditions that are leading people to turn to those kinds of leaders. And, and, and today that's too much to cover, but I, I promissory note, I'll, I'll come back to talking more about that one. Anybody else with a question about what I've covered so far? I, I do have more ideas to, to get through, but I don't want to completely uh, prevent you. And as long as we're in the breakout, anybody? Let me keep going then. Uh, and I, I promise we'll have some time at the end also for discussion. So um, I, I now want to talk about Putin as in the tradition of anti-politics. And, and, and here I'm drawing especially on Hannah Arendt and, and, and then some of the more recent work of Masha Gessen. Uh, you, you may uh, be familiar. She wrote a book a couple of years ago called uh, the future is history, looking at the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of Putin and the way in which the Soviet Union uh, was an anti-political society. And, and, and in saying that, she's using Hannah Arendt's language in her uh, magisterial study of, of, of totalitarianism under Stalin and Hitler. And, and I have, have done this incorrectly. I, I, this is not a quote from Arendt. This is a quote from Vladimir Putin, as I hope will be obvious once I read it to you. But this is part of what Putin said in his February 21st speech uh, in the immediate buildup to the invasion of the Ukraine. Ukraine, and, and, and I've put ellipses in to make it brief, is an inalienable part of our own history, cultural, and spiritual space, right? So it, essentially denying that Ukraine is a distinct society, culture, or polity. Modern Ukraine was entirely created by modern Bolshevik Russia, right? Uh, you know, a, a, a fabrication, obviously propagandistic, but here's the point I really want to drill down on. No political factors can or may be used as the fundamental principles of statehood. And that statement, I, I think, expresses a profound and profoundly dangerous political philosophy in that it diminishes or dismisses the significance of politics. What, what does that mean? It means, yes, there may be treaties. There may be a parliament and a duly elected leader. There may be the will of the Ukrainian people as expressed through elections, but none of that matters relevant, relative to this assertion, which is a assertion of um, historical and cultural and spiritual, you might even say mystical identity, right? And I think what is extremely important here is, is to ask what is essential to politics and, and what is a, a essential to politics as a rent, and I would understand it, is a, is a kind of pluralism, is a kind of sense that every person thinks for themselves and then has to come together to form collective opinion and will. And, and right, please hear in that the, the, the resonances of the enlightenment philosophy that we were studying together before all of this broke out, right? That, that we each have the capacity to think for ourselves. We each are equipped with judgment. We are each 
equal to each other and therefore have a right to express our views politically and to have our politics secure our consent. And therefore, we have to collaboratively construct a shared opinion and will that we all can take joint ownership over. That, it seems to me, in a minimum core definition is what politics is about. And Putin, I don't believe, thinks that that is a valuable enterprise. The reason he signals out Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great and Joseph Stalin as the predecessors to his rule is because none of them gave a damn about what their people thought, right? They, as a matter of fact, thought that the only way to run a state was through a strong leader whose strong will imposed order on a people who are essentially incapable of doing that for themselves. That politics is really about will and decision. And this is very directly in a lineage of anti-enlightenment thinking. And Putin, I think, at his deepest political conviction at that level is a person who does not think that the people have any right to participate in determining how they will be ruled. And again, that this is a illusion of modernity. And it may be that he is going to have to pay uh, a certain deference to that illusion by having occasional elections that are engineered to produce the results he wants them to produce, but it's certainly not going to constrain him from acting how he wants to act, right? And, and so he is at war, not just with democracy externally and internally, but with politics, with the idea of a diverse, pluralistic environment of opinion in which people think for themselves, form their own views, debate with each other, and have to secure each other's consent in order to engage in collective action. He is trying to exterminate that in Russia. He has no respect for it anywhere else else in the world. Again, I think he thinks it's mainly a delusion, right? And, and if you remember, I put in the title, Deluded Democracy, that's in part to, to capture Putin's dismissal of the political theory of democratic society. Let me continue very briefly to his geopolitical worldview, ha having come uh, out of his view of politics in general, or anti-politics, I should say, um, he, he has a highly selective history of greater Russia as a fragile project, as something that requires a leader like him, requires constant expansion and vigilance, because the West is constantly attacking and trying to chip away at Russia, would like to devour Russia for its resources. And it's only when Russia is led by powerful leaders that it can protect itself from the constant efforts of the West to diminish its power and to take advantage of its territory and its resources. Uh, I've, I've already mentioned that he views uh, the post-war liberal political order as a ruse. It's great politics by other means. It's what the United States and the West have used to enrich themselves and to give cover to their expansionary politics. It is war and great power politics by other means and therefore more insidious, more successful. He is not going to give any deference to that order. Um, his experience of humiliation is not only domestic, it also has to do in particular with the conflict and the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, his incapacity, Russia's incapacity 
the fact that it wasn't even consulted when NATO decided to uh, bomb uh, uh, Milosevic's forces to prevent Serbia's aggression, what eventually became uh, a, a war crime uh, in the uh, Yugoslavia as it was falling apart. And, and again, in this worldview that Putin occupies, they were fellow Slavic peoples. They have a similar alphabet, a similar language, a similar religion, a similar history. And Russia as a great power deserved to be at the table and to have a veto to say, no, you can't do this because of its powerlessness in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the economic experiment of rapid marketization. It wasn't able to do so. And Putin is essentially saying, you did that to the Serbs. We have every right to do what we're doing to the Ukrainians. And, and finally, this is the means in which a violent struggle for recognition is being conducted. Russia is now a great power again, and we are going to force the West to recognize it by acting as great powers do unilaterally, aggressively, expansionistically in our sphere of influence. And so part of the point of this aggression is to say to the rest of the world, Russia is back and is no longer the sick, weak man of Europe. Now, let me pivot for just a moment to the Russian people. And, and I wanna start with, with the big question, how much of this do they understand and endorse? And here again, I wanna tie this into the themes of this longer lecture series, now to anticipate or preview themes that we haven't really discussed in detail yet. I will, I hope, eventually get back to this lecture and be able to talk with you in greater detail about the reasons I believe that the Enlightenment view of individual human reason, its power and capacity, is not false or wrong, but exaggerated. And the extent to which our reason, when we are isolated individuals, is often insufficient for us to reasonably and rationally make up our own minds, the way in which our mind often operates according to automatic, unconscious, imperfect processes, heuristics that bias our judgment and our reasoning, and that that is, in a sense, rooted in the very cognitive architecture of the brain, and that we correct for that to the extent that we can by exposing ourselves to other people's ideas and opinions, in particular to people who disagree with us and opening us, our, our, ourselves to the need to not just think for ourselves, but to defend our opinion against people who think differently. And that helps us to recognize the limits of our own cognition, at least when it's conducted in the right kind of conducive environment. And so one advantage potentially available to what I maybe would call a polyarchic society, a society in which the state does not completely dominate the production of information, does not routinely and quite sophisticatedly replace information with disinformation, doesn't close down universities and newspapers and television stations, research institutes, all the sources of diverse information in order to homogenize and create an environment in which ultimately I want to say it is just difficult to think, let alone to form public opinion. Again, this goes back to Hannah Arendt, although the technological environment now is very different from the technological environment in which she was doing her work, which was primarily radio and movies as opposed to social media. 
But in a polity without a civil society, without the capacity for people to freely come together, form parties, associate, form newspapers and research institutes and begin to make the case for their ideas. And without an intact public sphere, a, 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 a press, media, parties, institutions like legislatures or parliaments that allow for the free exchange of ideas, thinking itself becomes distorted and um, much more difficult to do in a sustained, rational, deliberative fashion. So how much do the Russian people understand it and endorse what Vladimir Putin is doing? I think on the one hand, you wanna say, he has a great deal of support within Russia. And on the other hand, you also wanna say, the kind of support that he has is manufactured and manufactured in a sophisticated, manipulative process that does not allow people to think clearly, carefully, cogently in ways that we can understand the institutional and cultural preconditions for. And so then I, I wanna just focus for a moment on the distinctiveness of competitive authoritarianism, which is a 21st century phenomenon pioneered really by Putin, but now spreading to Hungary and Turkey and China and elsewhere, and, and, and please note, it seems to me part of the reason China continues to support Putin and perhaps is amplifying support for him is because it does not want Putin's regime to crumble and fall as a result of Putin's tremendous miscalculation in the Ukraine, because if Putin falls, that's the second most powerful competitive authoritarian regime in the world. It suggests that maybe all competitive authoritarianism is tremendously fragile at its base and in the right circumstances will topple very quickly. Competitive authoritarianism uses digital communication and the attention system that it creates, the idea that more and more of our time is spent on screens and that those screens transmit information to us in ways that are more and more effective at capturing our cognition and determining what it is we think, that we trust them more than we trust large, what are called one-to-many media outlets, right? That is Vestia and Pravda, you know, the, the state and the party determine what's in them. But in social media, it's many to many. All of us get to determine what's in them. Why should I disbelieve what some anonymous person who's just like me is out there producing, especially if it happens to confirm what I already believe, right? And, and, and so there are feedback loops that are very powerful. There's what I've, I've referred to before as the algorithmic amplification of affect. They, they don't just change what we think, they change what we feel. And they make us think that people who feel what we feel are also in the right, that our feelings are legitimate. And I'll, I'll just point out here that the part of what Putin plays to is this widespread sense among the Russians that they are historically aggrieved, that they should be a great power, but they're not taken seriously anymore, and that they are vulnerable to Western aggression, and that the economic sanctions being imposed on Russia right now, which really haven't fully taken effect, but that th those sanctions are just part of an ongoing pattern of Western aggression against Russia, that you need a strong leader like Putin to resist. All of this takes hold in this new media environment and is a, I think, quite plausible, but very fragile world view that supports Putin's rules. And, and, and I just want to note that in this world of 
digital communication, the instability of collective opinion that Arendt had already noticed in, in Nazi Germany and Stalin's Russia uh, or the Soviet Union um, is I think even more exacerbated. And, and, and we see this in the color revolutions. We see this in the collapse of Libya and Egypt and Assad's Syria that, that very quickly public opinion, because it's been so manipulated, because it's been so fed by disinformation, because there aren't really the conditions for people thinking clearly or encountering different opinions, testing their view against opposed views, public opinion, or I think the better term here is collective opinion, because there's not really the conditions for forming public opinion. Collective opinion is very unstable. And so Putin recognizes this underlying fragility. Last thing I will add for today is, is, is that um, the Ukrainian people, I think, see all of this from Russia. I think they're not obviously a fully democratic society. They certainly don't have sufficient rule of law, but for a decade now, they've been moving in a different direction. And because Russia is on their neighbor, because they are uh, uh, on their doorstep, because they are related, because they see what's going on in Russia, and they are also looking to the West, it's a very clear choice for the people of the Ukraine. And now that Russia is invading, they are going to fight like hell to make sure that they don't get pulled into Russia's worldview, Russia's um, uh, control. And, 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 and so all of that to say, uh, I, I think we're in a really dangerous place right now. Putin has staked his entire political career on the success of the war in the Ukraine, right? And, and to be clear, the leaders that he aligns himself with, they win through dominance, through imposing their will on the world, and they have to keep winning to maintain their aura of power and invincibility, right? And on the other hand, Putin has launched a war that there's probably no way he can really win, right? He might be able to capture Zelensky, decapitate the regime, destroy the military, raise the cities of the Ukraine. But the people of the Ukraine, I think, will continue to resist. So this is going to be a costly, difficult, hard to sustain occupation. And eventually, the people of Russia, I don't think they understand right now, I'm, I'm quite confident from what I'm reading, how damaging the economic sanctions are going to be. But eventually, it is going to really disrupt the kind of consumer life that the Russians have grown accustomed to for the last decade, and that really have made Putin, in many respects, a popular leader in Russia. And, and so the, the dangerous place we are at is that Russia and Putin in particular has backed himself into a corner that he has no good way out of. And in a sense, he's put the rest of us in that corner with him. I'll stop there, but I know you must have questions and thoughts. Who wants to start us out? Yeah, Flossie, go ahead. Flossie, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. No, no, still muted. I'm sorry. I thought I was hearing you. Flossie, I still can't hear you. Okay, here I am. There you are. Good. In all of the movement out of the Ukraine into Poland, as far as Hungary, all over, all over the place, we haven't heard that the pandemic has taken hold. People are on the move. We haven't heard that they're dying of anything but being ground down. 
this is an amazing thing. What has happened to the bug? Hmm. I mean, it I'm showing you a little, little bit of the data. Uh, it appears there are two and a half million Ukrainian refugees having fled the Ukraine, another two million internally displaced people. The Ukraine and Russia have tried to negotiate humanitarian corridors for the people to flee the theaters of conflict. Those corridors are continuously being bombed, and 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 so there's no good egress uh, for uh, women, children, the elderly oh. from the sphere of combat. Uh, and and I think it is striking. One of the things to note, which is is that um, many of the countries on the border of the Ukraine have had their share for sure of pandemic related illness and death have had policies in place to create safety and social distancing. And now all of that has gone by the wayside. And I think one of the things you say is uh, in conditions of extremity, yes, you, you, you prioritize and, and they're prioritizing providing humanitarian aid to people who are seeing their country destroyed and want to get out of harm's way, right? So, so, so you understand why they're doing that. Um, yeah. Is it creating more transmission of the coronavirus? I have no idea. And I'm not sure we'll know that right now, right? The data uh, lags, so it, it takes a couple of weeks to, to see if there's a, a, a new uh, surge in transmission. And I just don't know how good the testing regimes are. If, if, if you look back uh, at that diagram, right? In the first instance, people are going to Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. I, I'm just not sure how good the testing is in those countries. So, so yes. if anybody else knows uh, better than I do how to answer Flossie's question, please do. But I, I'm not sure if it's resulting in greater transmission or not. I don't know what I was hoping. I was I was hoping that somehow the Russian army would get sick so they could stop. Yeah. Well, the the Russian army yes is sick, sick. but it, but it's sick because it has conscripts because it has poorly maintained equipment because it has very fragile supply lines because its food provisions may be 20 years out of date. Yes. Right? And let us just be clear eyed about this. The fact that the Russian military lacks the kind of fighting capacity that you think it might have given how much money has been poured into it and how important military might is to Vladimir Putin's image of Russia, that means that they're not gonna go into Kiev and fight block by block and house by house urban warfare, which is probably the most difficult kind of modern warfare, that instead they're just going to train their artillery. Yes, yes. Right, and so in a sense, it's maybe even worse for the Ukrainians that the Russians aren't fighting very well. I don't think, given Putin's position, that there's any way the Ukrainians can win this war in terms of a pure military outcome. Um, it, it, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> yeah, if, if you want to hope for something, yes, hope that Putin succumbs to the virus, not that the Russian military does, you know, the, the, or, or, or that the Russian military gets so sick of its entanglement that yes. it takes Putin out. But I, again, yeah. I don't think either of those things is, is, is very likely. Bob, you've got your hand up. Go ahead and then I'll come to you, John. Yeah, I have um, a thought. You keep referring to Russia as the new superpower or the resurrected superpower. Uh, and yet, oftentimes when I'm listening to the news, particularly on MSNBC, I must admit, uh, they refer to Russia's economy as nothing more than Italy's. 
and they refer to Russia as a petrostate. And you're implying that they've got all these other resources that one might want and so on and so forth. So what, are we being disinformationed uh, by our uh, media consumption? So I, I wanna be as clear as possible. I hope I didn't say superpower. I think I said great power. And uh, what I mean in saying great power really is as much a mindset as it is a, a matter of economic or military might. The, the, the idea is, and, and, and to be as clear as possible, I think you're absolutely right that, that Russia's economy is about the size of Texas's, right? Would be another, another way to put this. So economically, it's nowhere near what the United States or China is, but because it's an autocracy, Putin has pursued a very careful strategy of taking the money that comes into the state from selling petrodollar, from, from selling uh, petroleum products and using it primarily to create economic and military power, right? And, 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 and to give you a sense, again, um, more information than I can share in a single lecture, but let me see if I can find this diagram very quickly. Um, and yeah, so, so um, I, I want you to look at two things here. One of them is how much Europe is spending per day on Russian petroleum uh, natural gas in, in this instant. And please note, this is hundreds of millions of euros, right? So the more valuable than the dollar per day, the 1st of January until the 2nd of March, right? And, and so as you can see, on the 3rd of March, the European Union spent $660 million in one day purchasing Russian petroleum. Here's another way of looking at this, right? This, this is Russians current account surplus, how much more they're selling than they're buying. And, and as you can see, it tends to vary with the price of oil. And in 2022, so far, they have a $20 billion foreign account surplus. They've sold $20 billion more to the world than they've bought from the world. So even though, yes, you're absolutely right, it's a small economy, it's a small economy that gets enough foreign currency through the sale of oil to be able to support a military that makes it a power in the world. Right now, I, I wanna be as clear as possible again. I would say it's a middle power, not a superpower. Right. If there are superpowers in the world right now, that's the United States and China. But having said that, it was a superpower. It retained its nuclear arsenal. It's upgraded its delivery systems such that we have no way of defending ourselves against them. And uh, it clearly thinks it has the might to gobble up its neighbors, right? It, 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 in a sense, it's, it's being revealed that the Russian military is not as capable as they thought it was, right? But nevertheless, I think what's more important is that Putin thinks Russia is a great power. Putin is in this respect, maybe still stuck in the 1840s in terms of his mindset, much more than he is a person of the 21st century. So does that help a little bit to, to parse these issues, Bob? What you're hearing on MSNBC is not wrong, but it doesn't change the fact that Russia has a large and lethal military, including nuclear weapons, and it's using it to try to um, annex its neighbor. Okay, great, thanks. You bet. John, go ahead. When I think about how this war may end, and hoping that it ends without the entire country being bombed into the, the Stone Age, uh, it would have to be some kind of negotiated deal, which would be a defeat for the re Ukrainians because Russia is not gonna ever be defeated in this war, as you said. Yeah. And when you think of what the terms of that might be, you, offhand, you would think that the best that they could maybe get is that the Ukraine recognized Crimea as being Russian that the two breakaway 
pro, you know, the two majority Russian provinces be separated from Ukraine and either be independent or become part of Russia, and that the Ukraine would promise never to join NATO. Those three items. Last week, Putin offered those three items. He said, we can make pace if you do these three things. And of course, it was totally ridiculed and turned down by the Ukrainians and the NATO and the Americans and everybody else as being totally unpalatable. The Ukrainians would never go along with this. So maybe they will after they've lost, you know, 25% of their population, but I, it's just hard to see how they could, how, how any outcome, you know, the more maximum outcome is that Putin's also said he wants to destroy the Ukrainian state so that it doesn't exist anymore. Perhaps absorb Ukraine into Russia. That's not inconceivable. But if they made peace on whatever terms now, they maybe could get away a little better than that. I know it's not going to happen, but it just does seem to be kind of a shame. Yeah, and John, I'm, I'm curious. I understand that Putin said this in a press conference, right? Or it wasn't even a press conference. I think he was meeting with <laughs> um, flight attendants or something. Uh, was this actually proposed to the Ukrainians as terms in negotiations, because I don't think it was. I have no idea, but nonetheless, he said it in public, you know. But then, and, uh, and, I mean, I'm not saying he could be held to it, but I'm just saying, you know, they're going to have to negotiate something where Putin wins. Uh, uh, if you have a chance of negotiating something that's not so bad, you know, not as bad as not positively awful. Absolutely uh, agreed, and and and. Um, I just think right now we have to be very cautious in separating what Putin says for propagandistic purposes, either for his own domestic population or to try to keep, you know, uh, some sort of plausible support from the countries that support him from what he's actually doing, right? And, and my understanding is, and, and again, there are limits on the information and there's a lot of spin and propaganda from both sides, but that essentially what Russia is demanding from the Ukrainians is unconditional surrender, right? And, and that, that uh, when, when they actually get to the table, the foreign ministers meet together in Turkey, that, that, that Russia is not saying, we, these are our three conditions, they're saying unconditional surrender. Right. That's their, starting, that's their starting point. But he did already. I don't know. I mean, I don't know that it would work, but um, it just strikes me that it's interesting that what what I think it seems to be an outside observer would agree as the best possible solution seems to have been offered by Putin, wh whether he meant it or not, it would try to get out of it. Who knows? But uh, it well, might be it, if you talked about it. Maybe. Yeah. Go, go yeah. ahead. Dan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just I just think that uh, in terms of this last exchange, we can't forget that there's a, there are other superpowers, uh, or there are superpowers in the world, and so what uh, Putin wants and what he gets uh, are two very different things. Uh, enter Biden. So, um, I, I mean, that has to be part of our calculus. Yeah, and, and John, I think, wants to respond. Go ahead. Wants to respond just by saying, sure, if you want to play, go back to the Cold War 1950s, back in the days of the Rand Corporation, telling us, you know, how many atomic weapons we could tolerate and still win the war, uh, we could start talking about that. But there's not, you know, people have been very cautious about even, you know, this jet planes thing or something or other that would seem to implicate NATO or the United States in a direct conflict with Russia. And, um, and other than, you know, Putin's already said he'll use nuclear weapons if somebody interferes in all this. What that would lead to, I really have no idea. I don't know what he'd use them for, actually, but, uh, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, uh, tactical nukes in the Ukraine intercontinental hypersonic missiles to bomb us? I, I, I think in a sense, we don't want to know the answer to that question. Well, that's, that's exactly right. But, but I mean, because obviously we still have mutual assured destruction. If he attacked the United States with uh, nuclear weapons, Russia too would be destroyed and the world would come to an end. But, the, but if he used tactical 
nuclear weapons in Ukraine somehow or other, maybe just one, maybe over some, maybe not a hospital, but something that's military-ish, uh, what, what, what would the US do? Would we respond with a new tactical? We have plenty of tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. They're there exactly for this purpose. We could we could nuke the uh, we, yeah we're over time I know so I'll shut up. Well, well no I I want to pivot to a slightly different way of reading what Putin said uh, a few days ago about the conditions that he was offering the Ukraine which is was where we started and and to note that the Russian people appear not to believe that Russia is at war in the Ukraine, right? That, that what's happening in the Ukraine is that primarily Russian, eth ethnically Russian Ukrainian separatists are fighting in the Ukraine and that the, Rus the Russian military is supporting them, but not deeply involved in this conflict. That the reason the Russian military is involved at all is because the Ukrainian government is led by drug addled Nazis and is doing awful things to ethnic Russians, et cetera, right? And, and the, the significance of that, among other things, right? It, it speaks to the degree of the power of disinformation. One of the things that Masha Gessen says is, is having been in Russia for 10 days at the outset of the war, the news in Russia makes it look like it's any day, right? There's, there's no amplification of coverage of the Ukraine. So it's not just that they're being fed misinformation, it's also that the tone and tenor of the news is like, it's just another day in Russia, right? Um, that also gives Putin maybe a little bit of latitude to negotiate. If he can say, this is a limited campaign to protect ethnic Russians from a bad government in the Ukraine, maybe there's a face saving off ramp for Putin. I am, am, am inclined not to believe that, but it would be by far and away the best solution, the most hopeful solution. And I would hope that if, if the Russian negotiators really offered that to the Ukraine, the Ukrainians would accept it. And here I had come back to Suzanne's point and that Joe Biden would be saying, take it damn it, take it, right? And, and, and that there would be some path to de-escalation. All right, everyone, I will be there in person to, to visit with you next week. Uh, sorry, this is so bleak, but it's important to, to try to understand what's going on in the world as awful as it is. Think you're gonna be more cheerful next week? I doubt it. <laughs> I'll, I'll be more cheerful. We'll be, we'll I'll be, be happy be to see you though. I'll be more cheerful because I'll be in California. But yes. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys.